talks about uh, SARS-2, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is the uh, cartoon of how the SARS-2, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. Um, it has an enveloped lipoprotein, which is visible here. Okay. Uh, it has an RNA with the nucleocapsid protein, the spike protein S, and the membrane glycoprotein M, and we also have the lipid bilayer. So this is a structure of the respiratory uh, syndrome causing human coronavirus. Now, the most common presentation of the uh, coronavirus is fever in 83 to 99%, cough in 59 to 82%, fatigue, of, uh, which presents in 44 to 70% uh, of patients, anorexia, shortness of breath, myalgia. And now we know it can also present uh, with GE, uh, acute gastroenteritis, and loss of sense and I mean lo uh, loss of smell and loss of taste as well. So if you look at the illness severity, we have the mild to moderate symptoms, and then we have those patients who present with severe symptoms, and those patients who actually are critical. So in majority of the cases, in up to 80% of the cases, the disease presents as a mild to moderate disease. It's only in 15% uh, of cases where it is severe, and only 5% actually require um, critical care uh, unit admission. So the risk factors for severe illness is, of course, ex the extremes of ages, any anybody above the age of 80 years, anybody with underlying medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, like uh, COPD and asthma basically tend to get more severe illnesses. Um, even patients with, uh, who are on immunosuppression or malignancies also tend to get uh, more severe illnesses. Now, for the diagnosis of COVID-19, you require to detect a SARS-CoV-2 RNA by the reverse transcriptase RT-PCR uh, for you to confirm the diagnosis of COVID-19. This is an old slide of uh, uh, April and May, which was basically from John Hopkins University, which was looking at uh, the case fatality ratios in the country that were affected at that point in time. And we could see that in March and April, it was basically France and Italy, followed by the United Kingdom, that had the highest case fatality ratios. But now, if you look at the most recent data, this is, three days, uh, this is uh, yesterday's data from John Hopkins, we see that Mexico and Iran have the highest case fatality rate, uh, ratio. Sorry. Now, the most important aspect of the uh, COVID-19 infection, which leads to a very high mortality, which leads to high mortality and morbidity, is the cytokine storm. So this is basically uh, showing how the uh, infection progresses. So first, we tend to get the stage one, which is basically the early infection, whereby we have a very high viral uh, response phase, followed by stage two, which is a pulmonary phase. And it is at this phase that we get the host inflammatory response starting off. And if this is not checked subsequently, we go on to the stage three, which is a hyperinflammation phase. So uh, if you look at the clinical symptoms in the stage one, we tend to get mild constitutional symptoms. Uh, we tend to get a fever, dry cough, patients may get diarrhea or headaches. As they move to stage two, they tend to get shortness of breath, they become hypoxic, the PO2 FO2 ratio goes to less than 300. And when it reaches stage three, which is the hyperinflammation phase, then they go into ARDS and they go into septic shock, cardiac failure, and multi organ dysfunction. So in stage one, if you look at the clinical signs and the laboratory parameters, you get a lymphopenia with an increased uh, prothrombin time, increased D-dimers, and LDH. In stage two, we tend to get abnormal chest imaging. Uh, we, may tend to, we may get transaminitis and a low to normal profile ketone. Now, once in a patient hits stage three, they tend to get very elevated inflammatory markers like your CRP, LDH, interleukin-6. Your D-dimers are very high as well, including your ferritin. So these are potential therapies that we can use for these patients. I mean, most of them have actually not been shown to, to be of any value, like your antivirals, your antimalarial, nucleoside analog. But there is still some uh, study going on for convalescent plasma, and we're still waiting for these results as well. Um, the most important thing is to understand that because this is going to be a hyperinflammatory response, we need to reduce our immunosuppression as well as to, uh, for especially our patients who are on transplant. Um, the therapies that have been shown to work are our corticosteroids. Um, the other therapies, the IL-6 inhibitors, the human immunoglobulins, and the IL-2 inhibitors, 
do not show any hard uh, endpoint benefits uh, in the trial. So this is uh, the pathogenesis of the SARS-CoV-2 as to how it infects the cell. It basically uses the H2 receptor, which is found on the uh, on the uh, alveolar cell. As it enters inside, basically it leads to activation of the inflammatory cascade and leads to increased uh, activation of your polymorphonuclear leukocytes, increased uh, activation of the macrophages and T cells. Um, subsequently, it also leads to increased uh, release of the interferon uh, transcription, and subsequently you tend to get this uh, release of your interleukin-6, interleukin-1, human necrosis factor alpha, uh, your GCSF and GMCSF, and there's an increased cytokine secretion leading to the cytokine storm. And this affects your lungs, especially since this is the primary uh, entry point of this virus, and leads to necrosis, tissue damage, tissue destruction, and the influx of leukocytes and the allocation of blood vessels. And then, which leads to subsequent uh, ARDS. And we know that because of this uh, cytokine storm and the uh, hyperinflammatory response, it leads to subsequent multi organ dysfunction as well and subsequent mortality. So, this is what a normal uh, blood vessel looks like. It has a normal endo, I mean, glycocalyx with a uh, subglycocalyx phase. These are our RBCs, erythrocytes, these are our neutrophils and our thrombocytes. Now, this basically happens in a hyperinflammatory response state. You tend to get the glycocalyx shedding. There's increased uh, diapidesis and addition and rolling of the leukocytes. Um, there's, there's reduced deformability of your erythrocytes, and there's damage to your endothelium, which subsequently leads to increased fibrin uh, uh, laying down and microthrombosis. And this is what now leads to um, subsequent uh, increase in your D-dimers, and uh, it can also lead to DIC as well. And this is why it becomes very important for us to be using uh, anoxaparin or a heparin when it comes to treatment of these patients. Um, remember that this inflammatory response is supposed to be a, a positive response in terms of protecting uh, us, uh, ourselves from the virus in terms of uh, in, I mean, our cells getting infected by the virus. So when you tend to get the infection into the, I mean, the virus into the cell, it leads to transcription and increased release of interferon. The interferon basically binds to the interferon receptors in the other cells and leads to release of the antiviral proteins. And these antiviral proteins actually uh, block RNA synthesis and replication. So the interferon uh, signals to the un uninfected cells to block RNA synthesis and replication of the virus. It signals the infected cells to induce the apoptosis of that infected cell and also leads to activation of the immune cells as well to clear up the virus. Now, this was a, a major trial that is called the recovery trial, which was looking at multiple therapies in uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infections. And what they found was that it was only the low-cost dexamethasone, which reduces death by up to one-third in hospitalized patients with severe, uh, with severe respiratory complications of COVID-19. And as I said, this was a very large randomized control trial of possible treatments for patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19. And they had more than 11,000 patients. And these are the various treatment arms that they had. And the only one that was found to be beneficial was actually low-dose dexamethasone, which had a mortality benefit. However, there's a, because of the cytokine storm and the pathogenesis that I discussed about, um, there was talk about using therapies that basically could remove the cytokines. And this is where now hemoperfusion came, came into perspective. So this was basically looking at polymixin B hemoperfusion. And this was a paper discussing the mechanistic perspective. And what they were using was the um, lipopolysaccharide polymixin B binding uh, ion, which basically bind to the lipopolysaccharides, which are produced from the uh, gram-negative bacteria. And it basically uses the same circuit as uh, a hemodialysis circuit. So you just need to have either a, an, a normal dialysis machine can also be used in patients, I mean, in the CRRT machine or even in the ECMO machine as well. And what it does is that it basically absorbs all the cytokines that are produced from the body. So it's the same circuit as the uh, dialysis circuit. So there's blood that basically flows through the dialysis circuit and uh, pass it through the cytokine uh, absorber cartridge or the cytosome. 
or the HA330 as it is uh, uh, marketed here. And it absorbs all the cytokines and then the purified blood is basically returned to the, to the body. Um, these are all the various trials that were basically looking at the cytosome therapy. And most of them were basically uh, case series or prospective trials. There were only two randomized control uh, trials. And all of them basically show that there was a decrease in your cytokines, a decrease in your interleukin-6, and uh, reduction in your vasopressor support as well, as well as a reduction in the number of days that the patient actually remained in the intensive care unit when the hemoperfusion was being used. Um, so what basically it does is that it removes the endotoxins, which is uh, either the, uh, the damage-associated molecular uh, patterns or the pathogen-associated molecular patterns which are produced in sepsis, which lead to activation of the uh, inflammatory response. So the rationale of the blood pur uh, purification of COVID-19 patients, um, we know that the immune the, the innate immune response is very, very important when it comes to uh, viral infections. And because of the, the virus itself, we tend to get a delayed or suppressed type 1 interferon response during the initial infection. And the viral replication triggers off a hyperinflammatory condition in the cytokine storm, and, uh, which leads to an influx of activated neutrophils and inflammatory monocytes and macrophages. And this is what leads to the uh, severity of the disease. So what, what happens is we, what we need to do is to basically remove this, um, the cytokines, which are basically leading to a cytokine storm. And what, what was found was, uh, this was a paper from Wuhan, and what they found was that the pro-inflammatory cytokines, the interleukin 2R, interleukin 6, and interleukin 10, were basically significantly higher in patients with severe disease as compared to patients in non-severe disease. And these are the ones that I've highlighted in red. Um, interleukin-6 was also associated to be uh, to be higher in patients who had a more severe disease and in mortality as well. So this shows that basically we need to remove these pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, from the from the system. So this was a paper by by Professor Ronko, which was looking at the coronavirus epidemic and the extracorporeal therapies in the intensive care. And uh, we know that the viral infection causes an immunitis, and because of the severe immunitis, we tend to pull, we, we tend to use mechanical ventilation, ECMO. All of this basically lead to increase in your uh, pro-inflammatory mediators. Okay, there's a systemic cytokine release, which leads to endothelial dysfunction and subsequently multi-organ failure. So the blood purification can use four different approaches for the cytokine removal. We can use direct hemoperfusion using a, new, uh, a neutral, uh, neutral macropod absorbent, or we can use plasma adsorption on a resin after plasma separation from whole blood, this is like in plasma exchange, or we can use a CKRC with polyfiber filters with adsorptive properties, or a high-dose CKRC with medium cutoff or high cutoff membrane. Now, cytokine removal is mainly carried out using a neutral uh, macropod absorbent. And very important is that the hemoperfusion should be used for more than two hours on three consecutive days. And this is the time that it's going to be effective. So when you look at the uh, cytokine adsorption devices for treating respiratory failure in, in people with COVID-19, um, the summary of the paper from the NICE guidelines, it, it basically uh, approved the use of uh, cytokine adsorption. And what it says was that the technologies described in this briefing are cytokine adsorption devices and therefore reducing blood levels of cytokines in people with COVID-19 and respiratory failure. It also stated that, the, you know, that these are innovative aspects uh, about the fact that the cytokine adsorption devices reduce harmful levels of cytokines in the blood. So the intended place in therapy would be in addition to critical care for people with COVID-19 and respiratory failure. So the NICE guidelines are actually endorsing the hemoperfusion. Although there's a caveat to this in, in the sense that what they say is that these briefings are from a non-randomized comparative single arm observational study and a series of case reports only. So of course, more studies are going to be needed uh, before they can fully endorse it. And this was actually uh, the statement published on 21st of May, 2020. Okay. And there are several um, studies that have been done to show the effects of for the uh, beneficial effects of uh, the blood purification systems on COVID-19 patients, um, which will not go into detail. 
So if you look at the operation mode, you can use the uh, the HA330 cartridge by just doing plain hemoperfusion using the normal uh, uh, intermittent hemodial I mean the normal hemodialysis machine. You can use it uh, concurrently with a dialysis as well. So you can either do SLED or CRRT with this with this patient, and it can also be used in uh, patients undergoing ECMO. So you can actually connect it to the circuit for ECMO as well. Okay. So if you look at the potential mechanisms of kidney damage in uh, in COVID-19, most of it is based on the cytokine release syndrome. Okay, and this leads to direct cytokine lesion. Now remember that even in patients with severe ARDS who require mechanical ventilation or require ECMO, they also tend to release a lot of cytokines as well. And there's a hemophagocytic syndrome as well, and this all leads to direct cytokine lesion. Now, the COVID-19 can also directly infect the kidneys as well, as this has been shown in, in quite a few studies now that look at the electron uh, micrographs of uh, biopsy patients to confirm COVID-19. <coughs> COVID-19 can also cause rhabdomyolysis as well as a potential mechanism of acute kidney injury. Now, this was a paper from Iran, which was looking at, it was a case uh, uh, series of, I mean, a case report of a patient whom they used the uh, hemoadsorption therapy with CRRT. And you can see that this was the initial chest X-ray of the patient. And this was before hemoperfusion. You can see that it was significantly worsened. And this was after hemoperfusion, there was significant improvement and reduction of your pro-inflammatory cytokines, okay? Now, FDA has also uh, given authorization for the use of uh, uh, hemoadsorption as an emergency treatment for COVID-19. And they allow the cytoscope devices uh, for using conditions where elevated levels of cytokines are present. Okay, and this is basically can be used as plain hemoperfusion or cytosol. I mean hemoperfusion plus CRRT or intermittent hemodialysis, or it can be used in the same circuit as an ECMO. Okay. Now this was basically a study which was done in uh, septic effects of heme adsorption on cytokine removal. And what they did was that they, the rats were subjected to sickle ligation and puncture. And then 20 hours later, they were randomized to receive either heme adsorption or a sham treatment. And what they found was that the cytokine concentration and the mean arterial pressure uh, was, was similar between the heme adsorption and the sham treated groups. But the pro-inflammatory cytokines were significantly lower in the or uh, hemoadsorption groups. So what they concluded was that the hemoadsorption reduced circulating cytokines, improved your MAPS, and resulted in better short-term survival in those rats who had the fecal ligation and puncture. This was another study that basically showed that hemoadsorption in cytosol showed a decreased uh, uh, observed versus expected 28. They all cause mortality in IP patients with septic shock. And this was and what they found was uh, these were patients who were treated with CRRT with or without cytosol, and they had approximately 100 patients in each arm, okay? And they were analyzed for 28-day mortality. And what they found was that the patients who were treated with cytosol and CRRT, their observed mortality was significantly lower than the predicted uh, SOFA score mortality as compared to those patients who only treated with uh, CRRT. Now, I work at the NP Shah Hospital, and I would like to share my uh, experience in uh, using hemoadsorption in um, patients who are critically ill with COVID-19 in our intensive care unit. So this is the NP Shah Hospital. Um, this is the main reception. This is the front, okay? This is my dialysis unit. Uh, it is a 12 bedded dialysis unit, as you can um, uh, see. Um, so the MP Shah Hospital is a, is a modern 210 bed facility uh, located in Nairobi. It has a separate it, it has a separate pediatric wing with its own pediatric casualty and pediatric intensive care unit. It has a seven bedded ICU and a nine bedded uh, high dependency unit. It has a fully fully equipped radiology unit with a three Tesla MRI and a 128 uh, slide CT scanner. It has an ultra modern laboratory with a dedicated team of pathologists as well. We also have a new tower. Which was uh, which just got completed, and it was supposed to be used for physiotherapy, maternity, specialty clinics, and a transplant ward. But because of the COVID-19 outbreak, we actually converted it to a COVID unit. So 
I'll just share with you the data that I have collected for patients admitted with COVID-19 over six months at the, at the NP Shah Hospital. Now, this is the background. The first COVID-19 case was confirmed in Kenya on 12th of March, 2020. Uh, as per 2nd of September, 2020, we had 34,493 positive cases in Kenya, out of which we had 581 cases of mortality due to the COVID-19. Now, the total number of COVID-19 cases admitted at the MP Shah Hospital currently is 157, out of which 41 patients have actually required ICU care, which is 26%. Now, from these uh, 41 patients, 27 were males and 40, 14 were females. And out of these 10 of these patients, out of the 41 patients of COVID, actually succumb to the, to the disease. Now, these are only the critically ill patients who are admitted to the intensive care unit. Okay, but if you look at the overall mortality, it's basically 10 out of 157 patients. So these are the various comorbidities of the patients who are admitted to the intensive care unit. So majority of the patients were hypertensive, uh, followed by diabetes. So both hypertension and diabetes portray the worst prognosis when somebody gets COVID-19 when they have these as the comorbidities. Only two patients had chronic kidney disease, uh, two had COPD, two had asthma, Two had uh, malignancies and only one was uh, HIV positive. Now, 14 out of these 40, 41 patients, the 34 patients, 34.1% 34 received hemoperfusion. 12 were males and two were females. The mean age of these patients was 52.9 years and the median age was 52 years. Again, if you look at the comorbid, majority were hypertensive, six, five were diabetic, one was asthmatic, one had COPD, and one had malignancy. Four patients out of the 14 that we did actually succumb to the disease. Now, the reason they have succumbed to the disease despite the hemoperfusion, one patient had COPD. However, he was transferred from another facility after a 10-day stay. So he came in quite late into our facility, straight to the ICU and was intubated. The families of the two other patients who succumbed delayed significantly in giving consent. Hemoperfusion and cardiac death following a rise in troponin and, uh, and had an arrhythmia. So the cause of death was the arrhythmia and possible myocarditis. But the patient, in terms of the ARDS, was being significantly better. So, in conclusion, uh, we know that COVID 19 is more infectious than influenza but has a low, lower overall mortality. Patients with comorbidities, especially diabetes and hypertension, have a higher mortality and morbidity. And the mortality is due to the cytokine storm, which we need to address. The only known treatment with, uh, with known mortality benefits is your steroid dexamethasone. Hemoperfusion is a promising modality of treatment for severe disease, but we need to get more studies done. And the data locally, uh, in my own experience, shows a positive outcome for hemoperfusion, albeit the lower numbers that, that I've had. Thank you. Dr. Vere? Thanks very much. Over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Baga, uh, for that excellent presentation. Uh, the order of the presentations is that uh, I will now make a presentation. So this will be followed by Professor Claudio Ronco uh, from Italy, our chief guest in today's uh, webinar. Uh, we'll then uh, be followed by Dr. Ibrahim uh, from Mombasa, the apologies from Mombasa. And lastly, will be Dr. Uh, Soki Khalid, who is an apologist at the Nairobi Hospital in uh, Nairobi. Uh, so Dr. Soki is uh, the other moderator will be working together with her. Good evening, and, uh, good evening Dr. Wery. Yes, good evening, Dr. Chucky. There we are. I, I'd like to use this opportunity kindly to, to introduce Dr. Wery, though he needs no introduction. Um, Dr. Wery, I think your presentation will be next, and I'll use this opportunity 
So Dr. Were, as everybody knows, <laughs> has been a mentor and a role model to many of us. Um, and he's the president currently of the African Association of Nephrology. Um, as you can see right there, so many accolades. He's currently the deputy director of the East African Kidney Institute. And uh, that is his background um, in terms of uh, um, uh, educational background, but he has also been the head of department of the renal unit and internal medicine at the Kenyatta National Hospital for over 10 years. And uh, he's also historically known to have been one of the team that introduced peritoneal dialysis to, to Kenya, as it were. So we are very privileged uh, and honored to have him as my mentor, and, uh, Dr. Were Karibu Sana, and kindly proceed. Thanks very much, Dr. Choki. Uh, since we are many presenting, there'll be an element of repetition, but I hope uh, the audience does not mind this. Uh, in view of the seriousness that uh, COVID-19 presents to the world. So it was first uh, described in December 2019 and uh, caused by the novel coronavirus, which is structurally related to the virus that causes severe acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome, acute uh, respiratory syndrome. The primary mode of transmission is through droplet and close person-to-person -person contact can lead to severe acute respiratory failure and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So intensive care unit admission and ventilator support is important in the very sick patients uh, who uh, present to our hospitals. Uh, the current situation is uh, the cases per million uh, worldwide. Uh, North America is currently has um, the highest number as shown, followed by Europe. Uh, it is followed by South America, the Europe, and Asia, Oceania, and Africa have relatively small numbers, as uh, we can see in terms of cases per million of population. So what is significant is the small numbers that um, Africa has, and for which, of course, we in Africa are very grateful, but there are certain parts of Africa, particularly South Africa, North Africa, uh, Nigeria, uh, that are particularly affected more than others. Uh, the African Association of Nephrology uh, recently uh, sat down with experts from all over Africa, from uh, South Africa, from Egypt, from Nigeria, Senegal, uh, Ivory Coast, and uh, formed uh, the COVID-19 committee uh, as a committee of Afran. It was chaired by Hesham El, El Shayab of Egypt, and the main uh, convener was uh, Choya Bwade, and these were the other members, uh, many, many of whom are familiar to us as Africans, includes Gloria Ashantangtang, who was the immediate past president of Afran, Ebun Bamkoye, and uh, Rosine David, Mohammed Hafez, uh, Mamuna Mohammed of uh, uh, Cameroon, Sarah Debi Neka of uh, South Africa, Abdul Niang, who is the Secretary General of Afran, uh, Sidi Sek, Charles Swanepoel, Elliot Tana, Ahmed Tahir, and Hibat uh, Yao, who is the President-elect of Afran. So acute kidney injury in COVID-19, uh, acute kidney injury requiring acute renal replacement therapy occurs in approximately 15% of all intensive care unit admissions. The incidence is increased in the setting of acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. The exact incidence of acute kidney injury in patients with COVID-19 is not clear, but of course, that is ongoing. Patients with end-stage kidney disease are exceptionally vulnerable to COVID-19 infections, and many will require in-hospital care. And we've had these experiences at the different hospitals, Nairobi Hospital, Aga Khan, uh, where patients from the renal unit do get uh, infected. And some of them have had uh, fairly negative consequences. Uh, today's webinar uh, looks at in-hospital renal replacement therapy, renal replacement for patients with COVID-19 and acute kidney injury or end-stage kidney disease, and the role of hemoperfusion uh, is the cornerstone of today's presentation, as has already been 
ably presented by Dr. Baga. Renal replacement therapy should continue to be delivered in a safe and timely manner, minimizing exposure to the staff with consideration of the expertise of the individual institution. The protection of the renal unit staff is extremely important and uh, uh, the need for adequate uh, personal protective uh, uh, devices, equipment, is extremely important and must be observed. Uh, the possible mechanisms by which COVID-19 patients may develop acute kidney injury include pre-renal, uh, like hypovolemia, cardiogenic or septic shock, could be tubular, acute tubular necrosis, acute tubular injury. This could be ischemic or toxic or is uh, mediated. Could be drug-induced, interstitial uh, lesions arising from this, or could be vascular, like renal vein thrombosis, thrombotic macroangiopathy. We all know the uh, tendency to thrombosis that the COVID-19 patients uh, are manifest. Uh, glomerular factors, collapsing glomerulopathy is, uh, has been described and uh, as a cause, uh, COVID-19 as an important cause of collapsing glomerulopathy or could be post renal factors uh, causing the lesion. The mortality uh, be as has shown in Europe, in North America, in South America, Asia, Africa, the mortality is uh, still low and Oceania has the lowest uh, mortality. But this is a, a rapidly evolving situation, just like the slides that uh, Dr. Bagger showed, uh, showed that uh, Europe had the highest mortality, but now it's clearly overtaken by the United States, uh, Brazil, India, and uh, such countries. So it's an evolving situation, and we must not rest on our laurels thinking that we are okay because tomorrow things will be entirely different and it uh, behoves on everybody to fight this uh, disease uh, effectively. The modalities of uh, renal replacement therapy, the available modalities include continuous renal replacement therapy, and as has been uh, added, the role of hemoperfusion is important, as will be explained to us by Professor Ronko. The prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, PIRRT, an example being SLED. In fact, most of us uh, in these very sick patients, because of the rarity of uh, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy, are quite familiar with SLED, and it's something that is extremely important in these situations because of the need uh, to go slow in terms of slow blood flow, slow dialysis flow, a longer period of dialysis uh, being the mainstay in the concept of SLED. But this will again be made clearer to us by the experts, uh, Professor. Bronco. Uh, intermittent hemodialysis uh, is, of course, important because very, very few units in this country have CRRT. Peritoneal dialysis, either as continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis or automated peritoneal dialysis, uh, a, or acute peritoneal dialysis uh, is equally important, particularly in children, but in adults, where again, where hemodialysis facilities may not be available, uh, becomes um, very important. The care of acute kidney injury and end-state kidney disease in the ICU, the patient should be relocated or cohorted in dedicated ICUs as per individual institutions' policies. So uh, the hospitals in Nairobi have done extremely well in this regard with having isolated uh, isolation with ICU facilities and uh, has had a significant impact in minimizing uh, the spread of this disease within, uh, within hospitals. The nephrologists, the intensivists, uh, dialysis and ICU staff will wear recommended PPEs and practice safety guidelines during the interaction with the patients. Nephrologists should consider minimizing or avoiding daily patient contact by collaborating with the ICU team and relying on ICU personnel assessments to convey relevant physical exam and ultrasound findings, such as the volume status. Of course, many of our nephrologists are not very young, and uh, when you're above 50, it will clearly risky for you to go into to, to, 
don the PPEs and the going to meet and uh, encounter the patient directly. So uh, what I do and what is advised is that you work through uh, the regular uh, ICU staff and um, give instructions and take instructions. Indeed, the place like the Robbie Hospital has a good system where you can see the patient in, the, in their rooms and uh, talk to them uh, as, you, as you are working together with the other uh, younger patients, uh, sorry, younger staff who will more easily enter the rooms because one would say they are probably less at risk than the older uh, the wazes and nephrologists. So you should endeavor to reduce exposure to healthcare providers. Uh, telemedicine may be instituted at some centers to re reduce provider exposure to COVID-19. In fact, uh, an interesting scenario that I watched on CNN was a doctor working from home, a nephrologist, and a computer robot uh, uh, now going from room to room to get the uh, uh, data from patients and transmit to the doctor who is at home, and then he gives advice to the younger doctors in the hospital. I thought that was quite unique, but of course this needs a certain level of advancement. Indications will start renal replacement therapy are similar to other patients with acute kidney injury. Accumulating evidence suggests that a delayed renal replacement therapy initiation is safe. But this area is controversial, as has been now shown in other in studies like the acute study, and uh, is an area which is still evolving at the timing of initiation of renal replacement therapy and the Alain study. Uh, loop diuretics may be used in the management of volume overload as per treating physician's discretion. If patients develop indications to start renal replacement therapy, or if an end-stage renal disease patient needs a dialysis catheter for vascular access, this will be replaced by an ICU provider or nephrologist with significant experience in placement of central venous catheters with suitable PPEs. Each institution should use its established renal replacement uh, therapy practices and equipment to manage COVID-19 patients with acute kidney injury and entrance renal disease. Hasty institution of new procedures like citrate anticoagulation or methods of CRRT or PIRRT outside of a center's expertise will likely increase errors that may affect patients' uh, safety. If available at an institution, the preferred modality for renal replacement therapy in critically ill patients is renal, continuous renal replacement therapy, or PIRRT, also known as sustained low efficiency dialysis, or SLED, and, and other terminologies. CRRT machines, if available, are preferred over intermittent hemodialysis in the setting of biocontainment, isolation, as hemodialysis requires one-to-one -one, one -one hemodialysis nursing support. Intermittent hemodialysis can also be performed in patients with critical illness if CRRT or PIWRT equipment are not available. In our environment, of course, most units in this country have intermittent hemodialysis, and that's probably what will be commonly used uh, in our scenario. The drug modifications in COVID-19 patients undergoing dialysis, the dose adjustments should be discussed between primary physician and the nephrologist and the clinical pharmacist. Uh, antiviral therapy, uh, no adjustment of those required, for example, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir combination, darunavir, ritonavir combination, arunavir and probisistat combination. Hydroxychloroquine has been excessively discussed in the setting of the views of the uh, President of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, but uh, there are safety concerns and no, but for this- You see my screen? Uh, I've been asked to cover uh, a little bit about the mechanism and management of AKI, especially on the base of our experience matured uh, during the <laughs> Italian uh, uh, breakout uh, of, uh, of the virus. So um, one uh, special 
uh, greet from uh, our university who is uh, almost uh, 800 years old and uh, we will really welcome you if you can uh, come to visit uh, uh, this very very old university uh, we have seen uh, uh, and this was a special date uh, uh, 13 of may to 19 of may in which uh, the pandemic started to move uh, uh, from uh, uh, Europe uh, and uh, from China uh, into United States, uh, into Africa and into Russia, showing that this was really a, a pandemic event. We are familiar with uh, jump of viruses through species, H5N1, H1N1, were uh, well known and more recently we have been familiar with the SARS uh, who appeared in 2004 but after that uh, no further cases were described while the MERS uh, identified in 2012 in Saudi Arabia caused uh, ARDS and multiple organ failure in several people and still are uh, is around and uh, droplets uh, uh, were supposed to be the mechanism involved. With this virus, uh, COVID-19, moving from bats uh, through the pangolin to the human being, we have experienced a completely new story and the pandemic is still ongoing. It was firstly reported by official in Wuhan city in December, and it was then identified early in January, and its genetic sequence was shared publicly at the beginning of January. Now, already on February 6, as you can see from this slide, I published a paper in Lancet uh, uh, advocating an attention for a coronavirus epidemic. And I said, we should be prepared for extracorporeal organ support because it is not possible to anticipate the extent of the epidemic and the consequent number of patients who require intensive care management. And then a tsunami came to the ICU and uh, you must have seen in television, you must have seen uh, in different media centers, how much uh, in the hospital we had to uh, uh, modify the structure in order to accommodate uh, several, several patients who required mechanical ventilation and required ICU admission. Now, we are familiar with the fact that, that patients can be totally asymptomatic, or they may have moderate symptoms, or they may develop severe symptoms with the specific lesions at the uh, uh, pulmonary level that may go from a non-severe pneumonia to a very complicated and severe uh, uh, <clears throat> infection and uh, damage to the uh, lung tissue, somehow impeding, as you can see in this slide, uh, adequate uh, um, oxygen uh, uh, exchanges and pulmonary exchanges. We published quite early about acute kidney injury in infected patients, uh, showing that uh, this is observed frequently in patients which have many other comorbidities. The ARDS associated AKI may be ascribed to several causes, including the immune reaction of the individual, uh, uh, where circulating mediators could uh, damage kidney, which can be also damaged by direct viral infection and uh, local damage. Now, if there is a pre-existing chronic kidney disease, uh, these comorbidities may actually worsen the uh, uh, prognosis of the patient. And therefore, it is quintessential to identify patients at risk, uh, possibly with biomarkers in the early phase, in order to be able to better allocate the resources, especially in the ICU. 
where all the use of extracorporeal blood purification technique may be required together with antiviral therapies. As you might have seen, even in countries very, very advanced like the United States, in New York City, they uh, had to cope with lack of resources to treat patients who required renal replacement. In Italy, uh, Remuzzi and co-workers identified viral particles in the uh, uh, renal tissue showing that there might be a direct colonization. And in Lancet, we published the different mechanisms by which this is uh, uh, damaging kidneys in acute manner. First of all, uh, we're talking about patients uh, that have a kind of severe syndromes that may develop direct damage through endothelial damage, podocyte localization, proximal tubular localization, mitochondrial dysfunction, and acute tubular necrosis. We're talking about patients who may develop diarrhea and hypovolemia in which AKI is a consequence. And finally, patients uh, in which uh, there is a typical development of pneumonia that through ARDS uh, and uh, specific inflammation may damage the kidney, which in turn uh, through fluid overload and hypo or hypervolemia may actually uh, uh, impair pulmonary exchanges. There might be a cytokine storm, uh, a, some kind that dysregulated the immune response of the host with the, uh, a secretion of damage associated molecular patterns and pathogen associated molecular patterns that may damage the kidney directly or through endothelial dysfunction caused by circulating inflammatory mediators. And finally, we can have an hypercoagulable state that may cause endothelial damage, rhabdomyolysis and kidney infarction with microthrombi, but also damaging the heart in which <clears throat> myocardial dysfunction may actually lead to arterial underfilling or venous congestion, and finally uh, lead to uh, acute kidney injury. Now, we have seen very soon that COVID-19 infection may affect other organs. Among them, certainly the cardiovascular system where particular attention should be placed, but also Interestingly enough, there is a, a, a involvement of the gastrointestinal um, uh, system, both uh, at admission or during the stay. And this is an important uh, 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 reflection on the possibility of superimposed uh, bacterial sepsis because of translocation of bacteria from the intestinal wall. So, our approach uh, has been uh, to a syndrome that is not just uh, impaired pulmonary function, but rather leading to a crosstalk between organs that include the gastrointestinal and uh, liver dysfunction, may include the cardio uh, and myocardial dysfunction, and in some cases, uh, uh, different syndromes involving the kidney may actually develop. On this situation, what we call ECHOS, extracorporeal organ support, has been considered an important resource starting from ECMO and extracorporeal CO2 removal, and then moving to SCAF, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy, uh, plasma exchange, hemoperfusion and other forms of, of removal of uh, cytokines can be extremely important just by modifying, as you can see here, the structure of the circuit. Now, one of the possible and potential application for extracorporeal therapies has been the, the fact that the, these patients have a dysregulated immune response uh, with early lung involvement uh, due to 
uh, uh, impending uh, cytokine storm. And in fact, uh, there have been uh, uh, different uh, attempts to use anti-interleukin-6 drugs, which however have demonstrated only partial action. So the question is, do we have other options? Well, if you consider that cytokine storm depends on a very uh, dysregulated pro-inflammatory response by the innate immunity, but also an anti-inflammatory response uh, given by the adaptive uh, immunity, you may have actually peaks of inflammatory and anti-inflammatory substances that uh, exceed the toxic threshold, and in some cases, uh, actually determine an endocrine effect, uh, which is not the uh, normal function uh, indicated for these substances. At this point, you cannot just uh, block the situation by blocking one specific molecule. What you need to do is to remove mediators blocking uh, the entire system of the immunodysregulated response. And in fact, uh, in the past, uh, we had advocated the use of extracorporeal therapies for uh, the, what we call the peak concentration hypothesis, which is uh, the concept based on the possible removal, as specific by extracorporeal therapies, of uh, mediators that are exceedingly high, both in the pro-inflammatory, uh, um, let's say, uh, range and in the anti-inflammatory range. And in particular, uh, we have advocated the possibility to use extracorporeal therapies uh, when cytokine damage and cytokine release syndrome can be uh, uh, considered. And at this point, uh, patient may also have an increased generation due to ECMO or mechanical ventilation or hemophagocytic syndrome. In this patient, removal of this mediator by different methods uh, are extremely interesting, including hemoperfusion using a neutroporous uh, microsorbent, which we had the chance to personally test uh, during the COVID pandemic in our hospital. Uh, of course, uh, during the organ crosstalk and the multiple organ dysfunction, you can also use several extracorporeal therapies to support organs. And finally, to possibly uh, replace renal function when organ damage is considered the, the end of the, uh, of the uh, uh, syndrome. Now, there are several possibilities to remove uh, cytokines and chemokines, but the principle and the potential that we have advocated is the following. When viral infection occurs, you have pneumonia, you may have ECMO, you may have mechanical ventilation or even direct uh, uh, immune response leading to pro and anti-inflammatory mediators uh, uh, systemic cytokine release. This may cause endothelial dysfunction and organ failure. Well, if you are able to cut the peaks of uh, these molecules by using hemoperfusion and continuous renal replacement therapy, at this point, you may lead to endothelial protection and finally organ support. The concept uh, may lead to the easy uh, approach to measure cytokines in blood, but this is not the right approach because uh, there is a cytokinetic model that shows clearly that you can remove cytokines <clears throat> from the tissues uh, that uh, directly goes into the blood and then this is removed uh, by the extracorporeal therapies. So, uh, changes in concentration may not reflect the ability of removal. Nevertheless, the important thing is that you want to acquire some drainage of uh, these molecules from the tissues and lead them to the uh, uh, circulation so that they can be removed, possibly uh, leaving uh, uh, concentration of these molecules specifically in those places 
where infection occurs and therefore redirecting completely the uh, leukocyte and monocyte activity. We have published in Lancet uh, also this paper, Management of Acute Kidney Injury in Patients with COVID-19, and we have proposed the following sequence, analyze indication, prepare, prescribe the therapy, deliver, and monitor. And when you see in the indication, when there is a cytokine release syndrome, uh, cytokine removal by using different methods, including hemoabsorption devices, should be considered. You have to prepare for cartridges uh, and uh, for other uh, potential uh, methods and finally prescribe your therapies. It is quintessential, however, that this treatment is started quite early in order to prevent the damage rather than be used as a rescue therapy. Delivery should be done according to specific prescription. And if you read this paper, you will find specific uh, uh, somehow uh, indications including the utilization of anticoagulation in the circuit. So when you have uh, infection by virus, you have the immune response dysregulated and organ damage. You may have viremia, you may have cytokines and organ failure. At this point, the steps could be try to remove the virus, try to remove the mediators, try to support the organs. Remo removing the virus has been used uh, in case of Ebola infection, but uh, for this virus, uh, viremia seems to be very low. The virus seems to stay at the level of the uh, pulmonary receptors, and therefore this mechanism has not been considered uh, quite efficient. On the contrary, the molecules that uh, are uh, utilized to define what the uh, uh, inflammatory status is, including interleukin, including epsidine, pentraxin, free light change, uh, and TNF alpha and other molecules are in the large middle molecular range that cannot be removed by standard dialysis membranes. They can be better removed by the new generation of membranes uh, called MCO, where you can see that there is a different sieving coefficient curve, <clears throat> or they can probably be removed uh, by <clears throat> surface modified uh, membranes with capacity of absorption like uh, polymethylmethacrylate or uh, oxyris membrane. And this shows uh, the capacity of these membranes to remove cytokines by absorption. Nevertheless, the most efficient method is to absorb directly these molecules in the blood. <coughs> Excuse me. When the blood is circulated through specific uh, neutral macroporous resin uh, 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 placed in specific cartridges. And here you see the case of the HA380. Uh, that we tested uh, in our uh, uh, in our hospital in uh, different situations. This can actually be placed before and after the CRT uh, circuit or uh, utilized as an isolated uh, uh, system. Now, this is a case of a COVID-19 patient uh, that was admitted with fever, uh, fever, hypotension, respiratory failure underwent mechanical ventilation. At day three, he had a very high level of inflammatory markers, as you can see here, showed hypercoagulability. And for three days subsequently was treated uh, with the HA380, displaying progressive hemodynamic stabilization, normalization of cytokine levels, decrease in inflammatory parameters and improved pulmonary exchange until it was extubated on day 12. I would like to point out that uh, there was a significant reduction in interleukin-6, there was a reduction in noradrenaline, and mean arterial pressure remained stable over time. Also, we 
calculated that uh, the monocytes uh, resulted to be more efficient after treatment, improving significantly their response and the phagocytic activity, uh, while before these cells uh, resulted to be somehow paralyzed. And the most important finding is actually the capacity to present antigen because uh, they displayed 24 hours after the first treatment, the increase in HLA-DR expression on the surface of monocytes with the increase in mean fluorescent intensity and the percent of monocyte expressing HLA-DR. Uh, this uh, uh, treatment can also be utilized uh, in conjunction with ECMO uh, to prevent possibly the uh, uh, further cytokine release induced by the uh, uh, extracorporeal membrane or oxygenation circuit. And uh, here you see how this can be placed uh, in uh, parallel with the circuit where you can have a sorbent circuit. Now, in the uh, paper, we uh, uh, gave uh, specific uh, information, but also we suggested also research, research priorities. Research need to establish the value of uh, new biomarkers. Clinical trials should investigate the early initiation of different extracorporeal therapies and what we call sequential extracorporeal therapies, which uh, starts with the possibility of removal of endotoxin if superimposed sepsis is present, followed by removal of specific uh, cytokine patterns uh, with uh, different uh, uh, patients that have uh, cytokine storm scenarios, and finally, the feasibility also of extracorporeal CO2 removal in this uh, patient. Also, studies should establish the proportion of patients with a superimposed bacterial sepsis that are more than you expect. And in some cases, this patient may require what you call sequential extracorporeal therapies. So I think that uh, uh, coronavirus in this case has uh, uh, many, many aspects that need to be still clarified, but uh, we have published some paper somehow putting some recommendation and these are in blood purification and you can probably have free access to this, uh, 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 to this uh, uh, paper. As you can see, we have the most uh, famous experts uh, published in, uh, in uh, publishing this uh, expert recommendation. So in conclusion, uh, uh, our uh, COVID-19 infection can somehow be treated with extracorporeal therapies for several different reasons, including oxygen uh, uh, provision uh, through extracorporeal oxygen uh, uh, membrane oxygenation, cytokine removal, through hemoadsorption and hemoperfusion. Cytokines can actually be removed at least in the peak concentration, resetting the uh, um, immunohomeostasis of the patient. Uh, um, large cutoff or medium cutoff membrane should be used to provide uh, uh, extracorporeal organ support, especially when kidney fails its function. And in some cases, uh, 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 CRRT can also be used in patients that uh, may require fluid removal because of uh, a specific fluid overload. You may want to follow my presentation sometimes on YouTube. Uh, it's called Cappuccino with Claudio Ronco. If you register to our YouTube uh, channel, you will receive automatically the information of new Cappuccino. And as our chairman has mentioned, uh, we will have uh, in November 3 to 5, actually through 6, uh, 2020, a completely virtual uh, webinar. And I invite you to register following the program in the www.irriv.com uh, website. Uh, hopefully, you will be able to uh, uh, follow this meeting and uh, uh, you will have the chance uh, to be at least virtually in Vicenza waiting for the possibility of next year 
to have uh, a meeting in person. And with this, I thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, uh, your attention. Thanks very, very much, Professor, for this erudite lecture. Uh, it is uh, of great uh, benefit to the audience and is something that we'll remember for long. Thanks very, very much indeed. <clears throat> uh, presently, I don't have any questions from the audience, but the audience is welcome to ask questions, which can be asked later uh, as we move along with the tonight's event. Uh, I'd like now to introduce my co-moderator, uh, uh, as Dr. Uh, Kalida Soki. Dr. Soki is a uh, uh, consultant physician and nephrologist. Uh, she trained in the University of Nairobi and uh, subsequently went to Sheffield in the United Kingdom and uh, did her nephrology uh, fellowship under the International Society of Nephrology. Uh, she came back and uh, successfully uh, put up uh, Sheffield's uh, Kenyatta National Hospital Sister Center program, uh, which we benefited from greatly while it lasted. Uh, Soki is presently a consultant physician and nephrologist at the Aga Khan Hospital, and she runs the renal services together with the other consultants who also work in that hospital. Uh, Dr. Toki has uh, had a great experience in this COVID era uh, in the management of patients with uh, uh, acute kidney injury and COVID, as well as patients with end-stage renal disease on regular dialysis uh, who have developed COVID. Uh, Dr. Soki will make a presentation uh, now or immediately after Dr. Ibrahim's presentation. Dr. Soki, I hand over to you. Thank you for those kind words, Dr. Were. Um, uh, and thank you for the mentorship through the years. Dr. Were was my was my home mentor when I went to train at the East Af at the at the Sheffield Kidney Institute. Um, I hope you can hear me well now. Yes, we can. Okay, and I'm going to uh, share my screen. Just so, um, as Dr. Were has said, um, the COVID-19 experience has been um, quite an experience for all of us. Um, I work mainly at the Nairobi Hospital, and uh, at the end of the, uh, by the end of July, when we were looking at our statistics, we had 357 patients and, uh, that had come in for treatment for COVID-19 infection in all of its various forms, from pneumonia, uh, we've had patients presenting simply with hematuria, patients who presented with stroke, and patients who um, presented with acute um, uh, uh, cardiac syndromes. So quite a varied um, uh, presentation as, as Professor Ronko has talked about, and uh, uh, maybe we can move on to the next slide. I think coming after such esteemed presenters, uh, mine shall be to do more of a summary and talk about perhaps a little bit about my own experience. Charlie, next, next slide. So we'll just go through some of this, but I won't dwell on it much. Next slide, Charlie. Next slide. So um, just as um, a summary, uh, we've talked about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and we've talked about all its various uh, manifestations. And as we're all aware, uh, many patients who come in known to have chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease are patients who do not present typically with these symptoms. They tend to have less fever, less cough, less sore throat, and present more with fatigue actually and abdominal symptoms. Next slide. So um, the majority, this was looking at COVID-19 cases, and this was as of February. This was one of the articles that was published earlier on. Next slide. And we can see that in terms of renal involvement, there are very many ma manifestations that we can have. Um, uh, elevated creatinine occurred in 15.5% of all cases in one study that was published and elevated BUN between 14.1 to 27 percent 
and 67% in patients who died, which is something we have also seen in the critical care unit where I work. Massive albuminuria on day one of presentation, also seen in 34%. I, uh, and uh, many developed albuminuria during their inpatient stay between 44 to 63%. Uh, hematuria in just about a quarter of patients, and I can tell you even as of yesterday, I had a post-transplant patient who presented with new onset um, hematuria and albuminuria, and uh, uh, we rushed him in, uh, and actually his COVID-19 turned out to be positive. The renal function is very stable, but he continues to have hematuria and albuminuria. And on CT scan, the kidney appears to have reduced density, suggestive of inflammation and edema. Next slide. So this was some of the real world ICU data showing um, the percentage of renal involvement or patients requiring renal replacement therapy who had COVID-19 infection. And we could see that the numbers varied quite a bit, I think based on um, uh, comorbidities based on the population dynamics and could range between zero to 37%. Next slide. So in terms of the pathogenesis, I don't think I need to go, back, go into this much, but just as a reminder that the kidney injury comes in as part of multi-organ dysfunction, the organ crosstalk that Professor was talking about, that we have systemic hypoxia, we have abnormal coagulation, and drug and hyperventilation reduced rhabdomyolysis. And of course, the cytokine storm that is the center of all of the damage that we're seeing with comorbid factors reducing our renal reserve. And then we have dehydration, drug-induced nephrotoxicity, superimposed infections, and direct cellular injury due to the virus. Next slide. So this was a, a, a study that was uh, published in uh, the Kidney International that was looking at the post-mortem findings of 26 patients who had COVID-19 in China. Next slide. Next slide. Hello, next slide, Charlie. And you could see that um, nine, it was just 34% of these patients that had shown, just go back to the next one, Charlie. Back, back, back. Previous slide, Charlie. The one before this one. Charlie, one slide before this one, please. There we go. So out of this, and this was post-mortem post findings. <laughs> Next slide, Charlie. Next slide. There we go. So it is only 34% of these patients that had shown a raised creatinine or new onset proteinuria. Yet we could see damage where on light microscopy, there was diffused proximal convoluted tubule injury with the loss of brush border and vacuolar de degeneration and even frank necrosis. And this was some of the things that Dr. Wery talked about with occasional hemosiderin granules, pigmented casts, and erythrocyte aggregates, occluding the lumen of the capillaries so that we could see there's so many various aspects of the kidney and of the glomerulus within the nephron were affected. Next slide, Charlie. And on electron microscopy, there were clusters of coronavirus particles with distinctive spikes that we could see within the tubular epithelium and the podocytes. And ACE2 was found to be upregulated in this patient. Um, immunostaining with SARS-CoV-2 antibody was positive in the tubules. Next slide. So in terms of the treatment of, of COVID-19 infection, no specific effective antiviral drug has been found. And what we're we have been relying on, even as a country, is quarantine for all of those confirmed to have COVID-19 and supportive measures. And the emphasis has been on early ICU cares for those with severe illness. 
Um, the recovery trial, of course, gave us the support in terms of the use of dexamethasone, and uh, there were trials still ongoing on the use of convalescent plasma. Next slide. So what would be the ideal dialysis mortality for these patients who required renal replacement therapy? If we were really thinking of what we wanted to do, we would want something that was minimally affected by clotting, readily available, able to clear toxins in these hypercatabolic patients, able to maintain a fluid balance that was cost effective and had minimal need for external nursing input. I mean, anybody who has interacted with patients within the COVID-19 ward and has had to do renal replacement uh, therapy has encountered the challenges of having to ex do exchanges and bags and anticoagulation in these hypercoagulable patients, and also having to have somebody don and doff in order to go and um, adjust the setting on the dialysis machine. Next slide. So in terms of renal replacement therapy in the acute infection, um, we have been using CVVH or CVVHDF uh, at high flows, which reduced interleukin, which have been found to reduce interleukin six and improve SOFA scores. At the Nairobi Hospital, in terms of critical care admissions, out of the total 357 patients, that was 33 patients, and um, 33 patients required critical care, and 75% um, 75 of, 75 of these patients were actually male. And out of the 33 patients, 13 patients had AKI requiring renal replacement therapy, and that was um, uh, actually 39.3%. Out of this, well, I would make an adjustment to that. It was 30, 13, percent, uh, 13 patients who had an AKI, and um, out of this, 11 patients uh, were on mechanical ventilation. And of those 11 patients, all of them required renal replacement therapy, and that was 39.3%. And out of the um, 11 patients that required intubation, or required, uh, yeah, or required um, mechanical ventilation, mortality was actually 10 out of the 11. So 10 out of 13 in terms of the AKI, mortality was 76.9, um, but out of those who actually required renal replacement therapy, and that was 10 out of 11, mortality was actually 88%. Um, Next slide. So in terms of anticoagulation, we all know the problems that we have had anticoagulation, anticoagulating these patients on CVVH or CRRT. And the recommendations um, uh, were a pre-filter bolus. And this is what we have been using actually, because the patients tend to clot quite a bit on the machine. So a pre-filter bolus of unfractionated heparin at 20 units per kg. Um, of course, uh, and a heparin infusion of 20 to 30 units per kg per hour, which is so much higher than the recommendation of 10 to 20. Um, many of these patients, uh, we have had to use low molecular weight heparin at three to five uh, milligrams per hour, trying to reduce the incidence of heparin-induced thrombo uh, uh, thrombocytopenia. Um, and in fact, um, because of the technicalities of having to go in and adjust infusion pumps and the like, into the COVID ward, many times we have also used subcutaneous heparin at one milligram per kg, even in these patients um, who've had acute kidney injury. Um, regional anticoagulation is preferred, but due to technicalities on the ground. Um, as Dr. Weris said, this is not the time when we would want to start experimenting with new things. This is the time when we would use the tried and tested and what uh, the unit is comfortable with. So we have been using um, low molecular weight heparin and we have been using heparin infusions for our patients that have required renal replacement therapy. Next slide. So in the acute infection, what else could we have been using or think of using? Of course, there's the use of PD that many in the UK and have, have advocated for and um, the use of SLED. Today, we're talking about hemoperfusion strategies and the evidence that there is for them and uh, ECMO has been found to be unuseful thus far, but so far um, uh, it has, uh, in certain cases, well picked cases, has been found to, be, uh, to save life, actually. Next slide. So in terms of the prognosis, as we have seen in our unit and has been found worldwide, AKI is an independent risk factor for mortality and greater than 80% of those requiring renal replacement therapy in the ICU compared to those uh, who do not require renal replacement therapy, which is almost half. 
and AKI also doubles the length of stay in the critical care, which is 10 days compared to five days in critical care for those who require renal replacement therapy. And I can tell you we've had one patient uh, up to 33 days within the unit. And finally, it's one of the patients that, that came out alive out of this. Next slide. So that is the, the end of my presentation. And just a reminder that we wouldn't want to spread coronavirus. And uh, lovely, it would have been lovely to have a cappuccino with Professor Ronko. And of course, with everybody else that we have all been involved in this and looking forward to the chat and the questions to come uh, and an engaging discussion. Thank you. You could now introduce Dr. Ibrahim if there are no questions. Dr. Soki. Dr. I kindly proceed with the introduction. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me take this opportunity of introducing uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, from Mombasa, Dr. Ibrahim Mohammed. Ibrahim is a good friend, is an apologist and a consultant physician. Uh, at the premier hospital in uh, Mombasa, Kenya, and uh, is doing a great job together with uh, other nephrologists in uh, Mombasa. He's had some experience, the use of um, hemoperfusion uh, in uh, COVID patients, and he's going to give us a case presentation. Dr. Ibrahim, uh, can you go ahead? I'd like to invite the audience to ask as many questions as possible from both the local presenters and particularly from our guest from Italy. Uh, he has truly a uh, great amount of experience in this regard. Dr. Ibrahim, uh, can you go ahead? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, wait, Professor Weber? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, I will now share my screen. Actually, it's an honor to be in a platform where by giants internationally and locally. Professor Weber, Professor Ranko, uh, my more experienced colleagues, like uh, Professor and Professor Sotik now being in an institution. My experience is very small. Uh, not with COVID patient, but um, the patient who had uh, CGSFs and active pancreatitis. I know it's a COVID uh, scenario, uh, but uh, as we had Professor Ronco, it's um, hemoperfusion itself also in CGSFs and acute pancreatitis. Uh, I can share my slide. So I'm going to share a test of severe acute pancreatitis, which we managed at a hospital in Mombasa. And uh, so the patient you see so the patient actually was a 44 year old male. And he was admitted in a uh, hospital in Mombasa from the start of September, last year, the September of November. The patient had moderate acute pancreatitis on admission. Within two days, he came with severe acute uh, pancreatitis with external distress. Uh, and the private ICU care was admitted in ICU and the hospital was set up on the 6th of September. Um, he was taking several antibiotics. I mean, you can see there, um, you know, the last of the changed 
condition starts to improve a bit in dialysis and eventually when the temperature starts going down. But again, you realize that only a few days later, about two or three days later, again the temperature starts going up again and uh, reaching up to uh, 940 degrees centigrade. And this is when then I decided that maybe this patient should, should benefit from more perfusion. So on the very night that time, the liquid will be crushed and it will not appear again after being off it. It's up to 10 minutes per hour. Indeed, the chambers of the night for the liquid will need the need to for two hours and then we follow it up on top of that together with the amount of three and the flowers in the state of reality. This is basically to see how it works on the 29th. As you can see, the temperature was here up to 39 to 40. Okay. About 40 or so. But then when we did the hemoperfusion, we find that the next day, we find that the temperature starts to start come down. And you can see that up here, it was about this level here, and it is temperature going down on um, the next day at hemoperfusion. So even the norepi, it was on 10 minutes per hour, but uh, the next day on the 30th is not a requirement on the performance power and consequently on the two and a half hours later it was not every one power to the event been stopped. Is a CRP of still 174.11 but come second you find the service of going down with this city also coming down. You can see that after the fever temperatures went down, you can see that the temperatures remained on, on the first. Come the second, it remained, but the night, past midnight, actually around past midnight here, we find that the temperature started rising again, just about almost 48 hours uh, post uh, hemo perfusion. So we decided that again we do another hemo, at least we another hemo perfusion uh, episode. Unfortunately, when we were hemodialyzed, he developed sudden cardiac arrest. Thank God he was successful successfully. Uh, but then he is. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, a bit faint, Hello. but be closer to the machine and louder. Okay. Try to be louder. Hello? I tried to be louder. Yes. Okay. So, so the patient was uh, resuscitated and was on double anatrop. So as we could not do the hemoperfusion on the third, we did the hemoperfusion on the fourth. And then at that time, the PC was going down. And if you look at the, at the chart, My screen. Hello? Okay. If you look at the chart here, you see on the third, on the third is the temperature going up again, up to 39. But 
So then we did the hemoperfusion. Again, for example, because uh, degree centigrade again, they went down, started improving after the hemoperfusion. Uh, on the fifth, after that, we found the patient's condition in a plus common scale had gone down to four. Is even after improving, his kidney function was improving. Um, but um, we tried again to use more perfusion because of course factor we weren't able to use more perfusion again. And then you see that the effect of the more perfusion this is like it maintained again on the fifth, maintained the temperature was maintaining below 38 degrees. Again, it was maintaining very well. But again, it was the night past midnight, it was the seventh. You find that the, the temperature started going up again, and the temperatures continued staying up despite trying different antibiotics. You can see it here again. The temperatures were still high up, and the remaining high up is up to the 10th. And during that time, unfortunately, I had to travel. Uh, so I traveled out of the country. The patient stayed in, um, the, patient stayed in uh, the hospital, and eventually was discharged. Uh, um, mid November, uh, but he went home on a sleep up machine. Um, if you can look at here, the previous before on the 59th, his PCT was about 100, which would be 100. The CRP was 175. As we continued, the PCT continued to improve. It's supposed to improve, continue to improve. The CRP he had improved, but then it's the time when he got a uh, cardiac arrest, was expected, and the CRP went up again, and they continued going up despite the PCT going down. Now, this, from what the short time or experience we had on these patients, after having had uh, three episodes of uh, hemoperfusion, we found that there was a lowering of the high temperatures within 24 hours, which lasted for 48 hours, and then started to rise up again. We also found that there was a decrease in the requirement of time support, as you saw, from 10 minutes per hour to 4 minutes per hour, they turned off, not RP, until after the cardiac arrest rate needed a double anatop. The anatomic markers, mainly PCT, CRP went down, but then, as I said, it went up again. Um, there was an improvement also of the general condition of the patients when we do hemoperfusion. So these were the positive markers we saw on the patients because we couldn't measure interleukin-6. So, but then the question comes this way. If you don't, can measure, cannot measure interleukin-6, uh, hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, you doc. Okay, okay, okay. So the question, uh, it's a very short experience. We can measure interleukin-6. Uh, um, my question is, could we be used, could we use, um, for example, clinical assessment, like temperature, uh, telephonation of the patient, um, uh, need for no APS uh, or anatomical support, as a marker in a situation to assess uh, improvement uh, or benefit of uh, hemoperfusion in such patients? That's a question I will be happy if. Professor Prof. Rampo, Prof. Were, one of our colleagues could go to guide us because most of the time with experience we are using it, does it work? So I will be happy if this question will be addressed um, after this case presentation. So this case number one. The other one, the other case which I which I have. Uh, the other case which I have is a different case which I'm having now. Again, uh, this one. another case again of acute pancreatitis, which we can pick in handy. And this is a patient again of a young man, but who got a bullet injury with multiple organ damage. You see, hydronymothorax with partial to the first right lung, you get four pancreatic injury, a five right kidney, which eventually for the to be stripped out. Uh, the colon was injured with uh, surgery, it was stressed in the eye, and then I was called in as a nephrologist. 
uh, it was a nice view. He proved studying to the board. Uh, his blood pressure went down, but on the 18th, he developed diarrhea and vomiting. And his blood pressure to increase again. By the 21st, he subtracted so the sort of pressure had increased from 252 about two three days later to 453. Uh, so I find out what the cause of this was pressure was affected, right? The, the PCT was coming down. His unit output was good, improving. Uh, his condition was stable. Uh, so I thought the only thing I could find in whatever uh, the medication I did was I believe on top of the PPI, so maybe the PPI could be the one causing uh, the risk affecting the kidney. So we stopped it. But despite stopping it, Again, two three days later, the serum pressure still continued to increase from 795 good urine output. But serum matter shot up to 2054 from 451. Serum was shot up to 851. The patient was at every. We did a CT scan to check if the patient developed a pancreatic pseudosis. We said there's no pancreatic pseudosis. So uh, we decided that we should try to use human perfusion. Uh, so we can lower down the risk uh, the pancreatitis. So we did four sessions of biomodalysis, uh, perfusion. We did three consecutive ones, the research one, then in the fourth one, which is the HA3 factor. And we find that after the four sessions, fourth session was finished on the 29th, on 30th, the serum amylase had dropped from x 51 to 47. The serum amylase had Increased from 2054 to 878, and the PCT had continued to just uh, 0.42. Uh, interestingly, now, then on the first, the patient started having again. So we did the um, perfusion on the 29th of, of, of August. This on the second of first of uh, September, the patient started having some fever, and the second of uh, September. The temperature is about 39.20 degrees. The light pressure started going up again to 1315.9. And the sound is going up with the CRP going up. The CRP going up at, uh, on the first was um, 54. The CRP is going up to uh, the data to 96.3. So when we saw this, again, we decided to do hemoperfusion. And today, just the temperature is going to 36.3 degrees. Uh, I don't got the uh, serum amylase and methods uh, results uh, to share with you yet. So, so my this is my small experience with um, hemoperfusion uh, with uh, triple catalysis. There's a patient who is COVID, which was in hemoperfusion this I think started yesterday, and a uh, couple shared the experience with the, with the, with the uh, colleagues. So we can learn from it. It's very pleasant. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks very much, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, for those two cases. I think they are, show us exactly what situation we meet in our day-to-day -day practice in, uh, re regarding this uh, new disease. Uh, I'd like us to how, now to go to question time. And uh, uh, the panelists are free to ask questions at any time. And uh, the audience, would, your questions would be most welcome. If you could write them down on the chat. Uh, I'd like to start off by asking uh, Professor Claudio Ronco, uh, what is the exact indication for hemoperfusion in uh, these sick patients? Uh, I don't know how you'd base your level of assessment of level of sickness, whether by presence of the general, in the general ward, in the high dependent, dependency unit, or in the intensive care unit. Uh, where would you routinely use this type of treatment? And would you recommend this treatment even in the absence of renal failure, particularly in the setting of the cytokine storm? That's my question, sir. Thank you very much for this question. I can answer, uh, of course, there is no uh, truth in, in our hands because uh, uh, we, 
have only managed all few cases, but uh, there is a rational, and uh, this is why we recommended the specific application. First of all, uh, uh, we utilized the imoperfusion in patients uh, that were in the ICU. So they were severely ill, critically ill, and uh, not every patient actually had uh, uh, acute kidney injury. As a matter of fact, in some cases, we try to apply hemoperfusion to prevent acute kidney injury, to prevent the damage. And as I mentioned before, uh, there is a kind of a pattern of inflammation that shows clearly CRP, uh, ferritin, and interleukin concentration that shows clearly when the patient is in a condition of uh, hyperinflammation and uh, 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 proximal to a very high cytokine release syndrome. This is the typical patient in which they have tried to use drugs like tucidizumab that is typically used to mitigate the immune response. Well, in these patients, uh, in my view, there is a great advantage in trying to apply a, a specific uh, cytokine removal using hemoperfusion. Uh, it should be done in the early phases. Otherwise, uh, when the patient has already developed organ failure, what you can do is to dialyze the patient, is to treat the patient for organ failure, but it is very unlikely that you can uh, somehow reverse or protect uh, the situation unless uh, you wait uh, for a long time. So my uh, patient, uh, as I also wrote in the, in the paper, is a patient that has a very high hyperinflammatory state, is a patient that is severely ill. He does not have necessarily developed acute kidney injury yet, but in our experience, he may develop this. In our experience, this patient uh, may also develop gastrointestinal symptoms that very often may lead to bacterial translocation and the superimposed sepsis. At that point, you have to treat the patient uh, with the very unstable hemodynamics and very likely this patient ends up in a situation of acute kidney injury. So I suggest uh, not to use hemoperfusion as a rescue therapy, but rather as elective therapy and preventive therapy, especially in the early phases when the patient is becoming more sick and critically ill. Thank you very much. Dr. Baga, have you joined us? Ask a question. Any, any question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, so maybe Franco, in the scenario like I was in, you find that when you stop the hemoperfusion, you find that the patient's um, conditions worsen. For how long should you continue if you have a hemoperfusion? And uh, also considering the cost involved, would we advise that? Yes. I don't know Dr. if if the question was was to me. I, I didn't hear the question because unfortunately, I cannot hear very well the audio. So can you repeat it, maybe? Uh, he was asking about the duration of treatment. When do you stop? When do you plan to stop the treatment? And I uh, believe the cost can be uh, the the estimated cost. Does it significantly increase the cost of treatment or? Uh, it is affordable in your country. Well, uh, so first of all, uh, uh, 
about the duration of the treatment, uh, I honestly suggest to try to use as long as possible the cartridge in order to exploit all the absorption capacity of the, of the, of the sorbent. So if possible, go for uh, four to six hours at least. The ideal would be to, uh, to have a treatment which is almost continuous. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we did uh, two or three sessions in three uh, subsequent days in order to establish a continuous removal or at least a prolonged intermittent removal. Concerning the cost, I think that uh, these are very critically ill patients uh, and uh, they are not uh, chronic patients. So the cost of these patients uh, should be considered as uh, one-time therapy. And I think that uh, the, the question is whether or not uh, the the, the healthcare system can support this. In our, in our system, uh, uh, the, the system is 100% public and uh, the government uh, is uh, uh, funding the hospital and uh, we tend to uh, manage the budget uh, using priorities and in the most critically ill patient, uh, we of course uh, uh, allocate uh, uh, specific resources. We know <coughs> that in other countries, uh, there may be a private uh, uh, system or a mixed system. And in this case, I understand that uh, the cost can be somehow a problem uh, for the, the family and so on. Nevertheless, I think that uh, the more these therapies will be used and the more the cost will decrease. Remember, the first filters for dialysis costed the fortune and now they cost a few dollars. I think that if we are able to uh, utilize at the best these therapies, maybe the cost will decrease over time because of larger utilization. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Perhaps, Dr. Curry, we can take the questions from the Q&A chat. You um, can read. And uh, Professor Ronko, thank you so much. I think I'm resonating with all of the things that you are saying. Uh, within the unit, we the, 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 the criticism uh, uh, for CRRT has always been that we don't start it early enough. And I think I, I've seen that within the unit in that we would wait for AKI and uh, try with diuretics and a lot of that within the COVID patients with our CVVHDF. And what would happen is that more I have started starting early and we find the patient stabilizing and giving them that support. And it is in this way with the CR, uh, CVVHDF that we have had two patients surviving, I believe. So one of the questions um, that um, uh, is being asked here is from SK. Uh, and we'll just take maybe about uh, three questions because it's almost nine o'clock and we know that Professor Ronko has another engagement. So SK asks, it seems that intact immune system is key in the pathobiology of symptomatology of COVID-19. Immune system is suppressed in advanced CKD. Could this be an advantage and might advanced CKD be blunting the COVID-19 symptomatology? Um, maybe I can ask um, Dr. Were or uh, Professor Ronko to uh, give an answer to this question, or really both of you. I would defer well, to Professor Ronko. As far as I'm concerned, uh, this is an interesting question that is not involving only the COVID-19 patient, is involving also the septic patient. Uh, Whatever causes a disruption of the immune system, uh, actually, uh, somehow may uh, be less uh, uh, disrupting if the immune system is blunted. And this is why at the beginning, probably, the corticosteroids may have a, an impact on the 
uh, uh, evolution. Because if you catch the patient, both in sepsis and in COVID-19, with corticosteroids uh, in the very early phase, you are probably able to blunt the uh, immunodysregulation. Unfortunately, once you have the immunodysregulated system, then this is, uh, of course, complicated. Uh, and uh, uh, it is, however, interesting to know that uh, uh, transplanted patients uh, were not significantly affected by COVID. Uh, and the same is true for dialysis patients. Yeah. So these patients uh, may actually have a, a less efficient uh, uh, immunosystem. Nevertheless, when you have a less efficient immunosystem, uh, you may have the risk to die because of the infection. COVID-19 patients are peculiar because they tend to die not because of the infection, but because of the immunosystem response. So that's why I think uh, this question is open and uh, requires, uh, uh, requires uh, more study and more research. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, let me also ask another question. Regarding uh, Africa uh, compared to Europe and compared to America, um, there's some, the figures are shown which have been put together by an upfront uh, effort and which will soon be published in kidney KI reports, uh, clearly shows that, well, our numbers are small. And in spite of the expected sharp rise, uh, such an event has not occurred. What are your postulates as a senior a physician uh, on why we are spared, why Africa is spared, as well as to some degree some parts of Asia? I'm, I'm not sure I really understood the question. Can you summarize? Why is, why is Africa not very much affected like Europe and America and South America? Okay, um, I think that uh, uh, we have uh, <laughs> a problem of detection of the disease. Um, for example, recently in Italy, they say, oh, there is a strike back of uh, dissemination of the virus. Uh, but uh, for example, yesterday in Italy, they did 150,000 swab tests. So 150,000 swab tests in the whole country, it's easy to find a positive patient. The problem is to understand whether uh, there is an increase of the number of patients going into intensive care. And in a place like Italy, we monitor perfectly every single patient because uh, it's a densely populated area. It is a quite an advanced uh, uh, healthcare system. People do not die because of lack of admission to the hospital. I'm not sure that in other places around the world, including Africa, but also including uh, Asia, including even the United States, Latin America, there is such a granularity in the detection of the positive uh, uh, patients uh, and in the patient that require hospital admission. So not sure, I'm not sure. Uh, there might be other causes. Uh, if, if, if it is true that Africa is less affected, it may be environmental, it may be temperature, it may be other things. But before to search for causes of differences, we need to make sure that the differences are true. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Okay. Soki, are there any other questions? Yes, maybe the last question from uh, Dr. Sue, nephrologist in Mombasa, directed to Professor Ronko. One of the challenges in COVID when using hemoabsorption uh, uh, hem hem is the clotting in the cartridge. How much heparin should we use for priming the cartridge since there is a high hypercoagulable state? 
Professor Ronco? Well, first of all, uh, we did not have, uh, except uh, at the very early beginning when we started CRRT in these patients uh, and we saw the hypercoagulable state, uh, we did not have any clotting of cartridges during treatment. Um, we have to, uh, first of all, monitor the coagulation state of the patient. Some of these patients already receive uh, heparin uh, systemically. Um, in the uh, extracorporeal circuit, we tend to use uh, normally five to eight uh, unit uh, uh, per kilogram per hour. And in general, uh, in these patients, we had to uh, scale up uh, the administration to 15, in some cases to 20. However, I must say that uh, uh, if you monitor accurately uh, the coagulation time of the patient, if you monitor accurately the pressure drop in the circuit, it's quintessential to measure the pressure drop uh, between inlet and outlet from the cartridge. And then you can also adjust the blood flow and possibly you can also sometime shoot some saline in the circuit to wash out the possible principle of clotting. I think that you can easily prevent the clotting of the system. I think uh, we are done with most of our hey, questions. I probably just one more. I think I'd like to know the situation of transplantation in Italy. Is it suspended? Is it continuing? Uh, what, because in, in East Africa we have suspended transplantation. What is your advice to us on uh, transplantation? Uh, as you know, we have published uh, a paper in Lancet uh, on concern about uh, continuing with transplantation when we had uh, the very high uh, uh, level of uh, um, uh, virus dissemination in the hospital. But uh, that was only for approximately one month and a half. After that, we were able to ensure uh, specific pathways uh, also for scintigraphic examination, for surgery, for post-surgery, for transplantation. And uh, we were able to do this in a very safe way. I suggest you do the same thing, uh, trying to, uh, to, to create safe pathways within the hospital for the transplanted patient. Then uh, you also need, when you have follow-up of this patient, to make sure that there is an accurate triage. Still in our hospital, for example, at the entrance, people are triaged for temperature, for symptoms, and therefore they are then uh, uh, given a special bracelet uh, that identify a symptom-free and triage negative patient. I think this is very important to trace uh, uh, patients and avoid unexpected contact with uh, uh, asymptomatic positive or uh, slightly symptomatic positive patient. Also, we do a large number of swab tests to the personnel and to the <clears throat> and to the <clears throat> doctors and to the patient, especially in, dia in dialysis. You must have seen that uh, we have published uh, the um, algorithm for, uh, for uh, triage in blood purification for hemodialysis and in uh, peritoneal dialysis international for peritoneal dialysis. And this is extremely important. Uh, with, those, with this method, we ensured having zero positive patients in our dialysis centers, which is a very important thing. Uh, thanks very, very much. We now come to the end of our session. We know that Italy is the heart of uh, uh, nephrology in the whole world, and they have proved it yet again uh, that Italy is indeed the center of nephrology. Uh, we thank you again for sparing your time. And we hope that uh, we will be able to meet physically in the future when the problem of COVID is in the past. 
I'd like to thank Dr. Baga, uh, Dr. Soki, Dr. Ibrahim, and uh, the organizers for this very, very important um, event. And I wish you a good night. Thanks very much.